All right, our moderator is back, so I think we'll go ahead and get started. Hi, I am Meg Hinton. I am a pharmacist over at the UVM Medical Center. Uh, I work mostly with oncology, and I do work a lot with the oncology studies that ho happen over there at the uh, Cancer Center. Uh, just a little bit about my background. I'm from the University of Kansas, graduated in 2010. I came up here and did my residency uh, inpatient and then took on medicine and oncology roles and then started in research uh, about a, almost two years ago now. And I have nothing to disclose. Um, I just wanted to get a sense of the type of people that were here. Uh, any of you doctors, nurses? All right, uh, and then lots of doctors and nurses. All right, so I want this uh, presentation to be informative for everybody. If there's something that I'm talking about that is unclear or you want more information on, please feel free to ask during the presentation, and I will expand upon it uh, to the best of my abilities. So I want to spend the first half of our time going over more of the traditional chemotherapy and the side effects of that. Um, and then I want to spend the last half of the time going over the, immuno, the new immunochemotherapy because the side effect profile is very different. Um, unfortunately, I will not have time to go over the targeted therapies such as tyrosine kinase inhibitors or PARP inhibitors. Those, that would be an entire topic of conversation all on its own and I do not have time for that. And then of note, I will be using immunochemotherapy and immunotherapy interchangeably. Those two things will mean the same when I talk about them. So before we get too deep, I just wanted to uh, have a quick slide to compare the two types of chemotherapy. I think it's important to look at them in this way because they are so different and they go and they have such different mechanisms. Um, there we go. So your traditional chemotherapy widely targets any dividing cell in their uh, mitosis stages, you know, synthesis stage, dividing stage, growth stage, what have you. And the immune system really harnesses the immune, uh, the immunotherapy really harnesses the immune system as opposed to actually directly targeting the cancer. So it's the immune, ther immune system that's targeting the cancer, not the chemotherapy specifically. And so it also changes your side effect profile. Your traditional chemotherapy has your immune suppressing side effects, such as myelosuppression and um, uh, mucositis, that sort of thing. And your immune uh, immunotherapy has your immune stimulating effects. So you're looking more at autoimmune side effects. So when we talk about traditional chemotherapy, a few things come to mind as very common such as myelosuppression and nausea and vomiting. Um, those two topics have great guidelines that you guys can um, look into. IDSA is the Infectious Disease Society of America. NCCN is National Comprehensive Cancer Network. And ASCO is the American Society, uh, I forgot what the C means, but the O means oncology. Um, and I won't go into these very deep because I want to focus more on the individual side effects of the individual chemotherapies. Other things that come to mind and that are often worrisome to patients are anorexia, alopecia, and infertility. For the individual drugs that I will be going over, um, I picked a few of the most important side effects um, and the chemos that we use most common in women's cancers, such as breast cancer, lung cancer, and colorectal cancer. And some of these chemos will overlap in, therapy, in uh, treating ovarian cancer. And I'll point out which drugs go treat which cancers and um, also point out the regimens they belong to. So doxorubicin is one half of the breast cancer therapy called AC, or adriamycin and cyclophosphamide. Sorry, I'm going to drink a lot of water during this presentation because I get very thirsty when I talk. Um, so the first toxicity that really pops into my head when I talk about doxorubicin is cardiotoxicity. And so these... Uh, Pa this can show up as either acute or delayed cardi cardi cardiotoxicity, the acute toxicity more of e EKG changes and, uh, and uh, rhythm changes. But 
The most common type of cardiotoxicity is, a, is cardiac failure, so your delayed cardiac to toxicity up to three to six months after therapy. Um, and this risk is really increased with your increased cumulative dose. Uh, in general, most pa uh, patients should not go over 550 milligrams per meter squared of doxorubicin. And as you approach that top limit, your increase of cardiotoxicity greatly increases. The thought is that doxorubicin uh, produces free radicals that causes direct myocyte damage and that causes, therefore, a decrease in the left ventricular ejection fraction. Um, so what can we do for these patients who are getting uh, doxorubicin? Well, we can monitor them very closely. So routinely getting echoes every three months. The cardiotoxicity that's associated with uh, doxorubicin is, can show up asym asymptomatically before they actually get symptomatic heart failure and it's more important to stop them when they're asymptomatic. Um, if patients do need to go closer to their maximum lifetime limit, there's a drug called dextrazoxane that we can give that scavenges the free radicals that cause the myocyte damage. However, we don't, uh, don't know what this does to the effectiveness of doxorubicin uh, because it does scavenge those free radicals that cause damage both to the myocytes and to the cancer cells. Doxorubicin also has a liposomal formulation that's used in ovarian cancer, and that was developed to decrease the risk of cardiotoxicity. There was a study done in metastatic breast cancer patients looking at patients receiving both traditional chemo, uh, doxorubicin and then liposomal doxorubicin. And the incidence, I have the incidence here, oh, uh, the hazard ratio rather. The hazard ratio of getting heart failure was 3.16, so greater with the traditional doxorubicin versus the liposomal doxorubicin. However, that did not have an effect on overall survival, so it's really unclear whether um, in that particular subset, the metastatic breast cancer patients, whether or not that's beneficial, um, which is probably why we see it more in ovarian cancer than breast cancer. Hand-foot syndrome is associated with the liposomal version of doxorubicin, probably because of its lipophilicity. And um, I'll go more over hand-foot syndrome when, he, when we talk about fluorouracil. And secondary cancers are also a risk with, uh, with doxorubicin. Leukemia, more common with traditional doxorubicin. And liposomal doxorubicin has more uh, oral cancer, secondary cancers. Cyclophosphamide is the other half of AC, and it's also associated with cardiotoxicity, though it's really mostly with the high-dose uh, cyclophosphamide and not with the doses that patients receive with uh, breast cancer treatment. But the risk does increase if it's given with doxorubicin because of the doxorubicin's cardiotoxicity in itself. And for frame of reference, high dose means something like 800 milligrams per meter squared per day for four days in a row, as opposed to the dosing for breast cancer patients, which is 600 milligrams per meter squared, uh, excuse me, per meter squared on day one of a two-week cycle. So it's much lower. Pulmonary toxicity is also seen with the higher doses of cyclophosphamide, the acute uh, pulmonary toxicity is often reversible, but it can show up uh, even years past therapy as a delayed pneumo uh, pulmonary toxicity, and that's not reversible. Hemorrhagic cystitis is also associated with higher doses, and that's because cyclophosphamide produces a toxic metabolite called acrolein that likes to sit in the bladder and cause irritation and bleeding. And we use a drug called mesna to bind the acrolein in the bladder to, um, to prevent it from causing that irritation. For breast cancer patients, we don't usually give mesna because like I said, the doses are much lower. So we encourage hydration and frequent urination to flush out the acrolein and make sure it doesn't stay in the bladder to irritate. Secondary malignancies are also a possibility with cyclophosphamide, bladder cancer specifically if they have hemorrhagic cystitis, but also leukemias, lymphomas, sarcomas, that sort of thing. Cyclophosphamide is also combined with docetaxel and paclitaxel, 
And the first thing that comes to mind when I talk about these agents is the infusion reaction risk. And we, um, it's due to this cremophore, which is a castor oil derivative that's used to dil uh, as a diluent in paclitaxel, more so than docetaxel, but it's still present in both. Paclitaxel can have an infusion reaction rate of 35 to 40 percent, even with premedication with famotidine or some sort of H2 agonist antagonist, uh, Benadryl, Tylenol, um, and it can, st it can still be pretty, uh, have significant side of, uh, excuse me, sorry, can have significant infusion reactions. Docetaxel has an infusion reaction rate of only about 15 percent, and so patients, if they react on paclitaxel, they can be switched over to docetaxel um, to see if they can tolerate that better and, and not react to the docetaxel. Neuropathy is also a, a reality when it comes to giving paclitaxel. Um, it's usually made worse. It's usually associated with cumul cumulative dosing and patients who have pre-existing neuropathy due to um, diabetes or, or um, other pre-existing neuropathies. And docetaxel has this odd fluid retention side effect that we have to use dexamethasone to prevent d the day before and the day after. And it starts out as a peripheral, neuro a peripheral edema and works its way up to ascites, shortness of breath, um, uh, generalized edemia, pleural effusions. And that can take quite a while to resolve once you do, uh, once you do s develop it. It's usually associated with higher cumulative doses, but it can happen any time during therapy. And it takes a while to resolve, up to 16 weeks. I feel like I'm talking pretty fast. Is everybody gathering what they need to? OK, I'll talk louder. OK, I'll talk louder, too. Sorry. Um, so moving on, platinum, so cisplatin, carboplatin, and oxaliplatin are all used for breast cancer, lung cancer, ovarian cancer, and colorectal cancer. I have to say that cisplatin is probably one of the nastiest chemotherapies out there. It causes very bad nausea and vomiting for our patients, but it also causes a lot of potentially permanent, permanent issues. Cisplatin causes very significant nephrotoxicity, more so than carboplatin. So we, again, hydrate, 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 and keep a close eye on their serum creatinine to make sure it doesn't, uh, it, it, they don't develop an uh, acute kidney injury. Patients on cisplatin also can develop tinnitus and ototoxicity, difficulty hearing. And the thought is that the higher the higher the dose, the higher the peak after that infusion, and it's that peak that often causes that ototoxicity. So there's some thought to, um, for patients who are getting high doses to split the chemotherapy between a couple of days, and that decreases the peak and theoretically decreases the risk of ototoxicity. Not usually. Tinnitus, yeah, after it, after, uh, as long as you decrease, uh, discontinue therapy, but if you actually have hearing loss from it, it's not reversible. Um, patients will often get auto, uh, auditory exams at the beginning of therapy and then through therapy to hopefully catch it before they notice that there's uh, ototoxicity. Um, oxaliplatin has this, has an incidence of neuropathy, but it also has this interesting cold-induced paresthesias, where uh, within an hour or two or up to a few days after the oxaliplatin infusion, patients can develop a sensitivity to cold. Even cold beverages can cause their throat to tighten up. So we counsel patients to avoid cold beverages and to cover up while they go outside, um, because I imagine that it's quite scary when you're drinking a cold beverage and suddenly your throat decides to to, to clamp up. Um, this usually resolves within a couple of weeks, but it can recur again if you treat the patients with oxaliplatin. 
coal-induced parasitias aren't specifically a, an indication to discontinue therapy. It's just a matter of counseling to make sure the patients are aware of it and to avoid cold beverages and cold environments. And interestingly enough, cisplatin and carbo and oxaliplatin can uh, induce anaphylactic reactions at any point in therapy. It's not that, you know, if they don't react within the first couple of cycles that they're probably fine. At our institution, we found that there, is, there tends to be an uptick of reactions at around cycles 8 through 12 if they continue on. Um, it's kind of, we don't know why that is, but at our institution, that's the trend that we have seen. So Herceptin, or trastuzumab, is, a, is used in HER2 positive breast cancer, as I'm sure you all are aware, but it's also used in HER2 positive gastric cancers. And like with mono, many monoclonal antibodies, this has a risk of infusion reactions, but it's much, much lower than, say, uh, other infusion, other monoclonal antibodies, say uh, rituximab, that's used for lymphoma. Trastuzumab also increases the risk of, of cardiotoxicity, uh, but it's a different type of cardiotoxicity than with doxorubicin. Doxorubicin is um, more of a myocyte damage. This is an actual loss of contractility. So our patients um, who are receiving only trastuzumab, there's an incidence of 3 to 7 percent with monotherapy, but as they add cardiotoxic, other cardiotoxic therapies such as doxorubicin as with you, when you would do AC, uh, the incidence increases dramatically tw up to 27 percent. And even when given with paclitaxel, the incidence of cardiotoxicity is, is up to 18 percent. So with these patients, again, we do echoes, we do uh, left, left ventricular ejection fraction monitoring every three months. And um, especially if they have an increased risk, so they have heart disease or hypertension. This car cardiotoxicity is usually reversible. Their, left of their LVEF will go back to normal. However, there's no information on whether or not we can rechallenge these patients after they've, they've had, um, after they recover. So fluorouracil and capecitabine are used for, uh, sorry, time check. So fluorouracil and capecitabine are used for colorectal cancer, and um, fluorouracil is sometimes given with cyclophosphamide and methotrexate in breast cancer. And diarrhea is probably the most common side effect that we're going to see with these patients. Capecitabine tends to be more diarrhea, has, tends to have more diarrhea, but both of them can, can cause pretty severe diarrhea to the point of needing to be admitted for IV hydration and management. So with these, with, um, with this, these drugs, you can rechallenge after they've had a diarrhea episode, but you will decrease the dose. And it's just supportive management at this point with IV fluids, electrolytes, and, and something like uh, loperamide. And so hand-foot syndrome is also common, as I mentioned, uh, with the liposomal doxorubicin. And what that is is a, it's a symmetrical erythematous swelling in, your, in the extremities. It usually starts out as num numbness and tingling and then pro uh, progresses to that uh, edematous erythemic pain. And it's, uh, it can resolve with dis discontinuing therapy um, but it does take time, and oftentimes patients will shed their skin. They'll have peeling on their, their fingers and on their feet. This happens more so with capecitabine than fluorouracil. Um, yeah, it does, oh, sorry. There we go. It does resolve uh, once you stop, and you can rechallenge even if they do develop this uh, hand-foot syndrome just at a lower dose. I think that in the places that it's just the the localized reaction that's the erythematous. I don't think it's more it's a systemic uh, it's just a systemic reaction like it is with the systemic flurry or so. Yeah. 
So the, the last thing that I wanted to mention with fluorouracil is this dihydropyr sorry, dihydropyrimidine dehydrogenase deficiency. And it's, <laughs> it's a lot of words. I'm going to refer to it as DPD. But it's, um, it's rare, very rare. But it's worth mentioning just because of the severity of it. And what this is, it's, a genet it's some sort of genetic uh, lack of this dihydropyramine dehydrogenase. And that confers an inability to uh, metabolize the 5-FU and, and get rid of it. And so with these, pati with these patients, you see extreme pancytopenia, extreme mucositis, um, extreme side effects within 48 hours of dosing with, these pa with a fluorouracil just because the fluorouracil bu builds up and their body's not getting rid of it. And in that case, there is an antidote called uridine triacetate. Sorry, need another drink. Um, which is a pyrimidine analog, and that's a direct antidote to the fluorouracil. And what it does is it integrates itself in the RNA instead of the 5-fluorouracil, and therefore bypasses um, the, the, the uh, sorry, nope, let me try again. It gets incorporated into the RNA instead of the 5-FU, so the cells of the bone marrow can continue to uh, divide and continue to uh, produce red blood cells and white blood cells and that sort of thing. And so it decreases the severity of the bone marrow suppression and the mucositis. Um, the important thing about this uridine triacetate is that it has to be initiated within 96 hours of the fluorouracil administration. And fortunately, it has been recently FDA approved. Before that, it had to be uh, emergently procured through the FDA in if a patient had uh, this particular deficiency. Um, and it's very important. I've been mentioning whether you can rechallenge or not rechallenge. Well, this is a situation where you would not rechallenge a patient with fluorouracil, regardless of how much you decrease the dose. And pemetrexid is the last traditional chemotherapy I'm going to mention. Um, I want to get on to the immunotherapy, which is my favorite topic. So pemetrexid is used with uh, carboplatin for lung cancer, and it's an antifolate, and it inhibits multiple folate enzymes, and it um, and it tends to have this uh, rash that develops pretty quickly after initiation. So in order to avoid to decrease the uh, incidence of this rash, we give dexamethasone before and after uh, this therapy um, for. Uh, the hematologic toxicity and the GI toxicities, we give fol uh, folic acid and B12 administration. And this is important because in trials, uh, pemetrexid was associated with pretty significant uh, uh, neutropenia and GI toxicities. And so they found that giving folate and B12 decreased the severity of it and kept patients on track for their therapy. There has been some incidence of hepatotoxicity with pemetrexid, and that's mostly due to patients with previous hepatic illnesses such as cirrhosis or if they have liver metastases. Um, I wanted to mention pneumonitis with pemetrexid because it is rare, but it is a significant side effect that we need to be aware of. Um, and especially with this population uh, with lung cancer patients, they often can develop post-obstructive pneumonia uh, but we want to keep pneumonitis on our differential if they do show up at our doorstep with shortness of breath. And finally, I wanted to mention with pemetrexid, even though it's not specifically a side effect, uh, it is uh, excreted by the kidneys and NSAIDs uh, interfere with, with the excretion. So you want to avoid ibuprofen and naproxen um, three days before and three days after. Pemetrexid administration, and that's longer if the patients have uh, pre existing renal dysfunction. Um, oh, uh, aspirin for patients uh, who get it for cardiovascular health, they can continue to take their aspirin 325 daily or their aspirin 81 milligrams daily. There was a study that looked up. A pharmacokinetic study that looked at pemetrexid one-time dose and then giving the patient 325 milligrams of aspirin every six hours and there was no 
significant change in toxicity due to the pemetrexid. So they, they can continue to take their cardiovascular aspirin. All right, my favorite topic. Got to take a drink before I move on. So before we get, go too deep into immunotherapy, I just wanted to go over the immunotherapy pathways. Um, the, so the CTLA-4 and the CD28 mechanisms, and I wish I had a laser pointer so I could point them out to you. I'll point them out and then come back and talk. So the CTLA, CD28, and the PD PD1 and PDL1 pathways are probably the most common uh, mechanisms that we have found that we can use immunotherapy on. The CTLA4 and or the, uh, those pathways, the pointer. Oh, that's amazing! Thank you. Um, so when the, when the antigen-presenting cell and the T cell meet and those, those receptors interact, that down-regulates the T cell and suppresses T cell reactions. And so if you block any of those receptors, that doesn't allow that T cell reception, uh, that T cell suppression, and it allows the T cell to upregulate and um, attack whatever the antigen-presenting cell is presenting to that T cell. Same thing with the tumor cell. The tumor cell often has, tumor cell can have that PDL1 inhibitor or PDL1 receptor on it, and if it matches with the PD1 receptor on the T cell, it down regulates the T, the T cell. If that interaction is blocked, it doesn't down regulate the T cell, and the T cell says, hey, you really are a cancer cell, you should not be here, and the T cell attacks the cancer cell. That's the antigen presenting cell. So let's try this. Immune system cell, immune system cell. I'm not really going into that. And then tumor cell. And this uh, and targets towards CTLA4 and PD1 and PDL1 have shown utility in all sorts of uh, solid tumors. Uh, you name it, they've tried it. So sarcomas, head and neck, colorectal, prostate, breast, glioblastoma, um, mesothelioma, and the list goes on. And they've actually found that in certain lymphomas, uh, PD-1 inhibitors do work. For example, nivolumab is a PD-1 inhibitor, and it's been FDA approved for uh, Hodgkin's lymphoma. So I wanted to review a study on checkpoint inhibitors, and so uh, when I, oops, sorry. When I refer to checkpoint inhibitors, I am talking about the targets to CTLA-4 and targets towards PD-1 and PD-L1. Um, and I, to me, this study is, is one of the cornerstone studies looking at both the efficacy but also the side effects of, of these therapies, particularly the combination therapies of two checkpoint inhibitors. So this study looked at the combination of using nivolumab plus ipilimumab versus ipilimumab alone versus nivolumab alone in patients with un, uh, untreated, unresectable malignant melanoma. And uh, they randomized the patients one-to-one-to-one -to, -one -to, -one to each arm. The primary endpoints were progression-free survival and overall survival. And only progression-free survival has been reported so far because overall survival is ongoing which I think is pretty amazing because mel melanoma tends to be very, very hard to treat and the prognosis is pretty grim. Um, patients were included if they had known melanoma, they had pretty good performance status, they had measurable, measurable disease, they had to know their BRAF mutation status, and they also had to be able to be tested for PD-1, PD-L1 on their tumor, so that same receptor that I pointed out earlier. Uh, they didn't use that as an inclusion or exclusion criteria, but um, there is some thought that the presence of PD-L1 on the tumor cells can increase your response to nivolumab or pembrolizumab or the, the uh, drugs that target those cells or target that receptor. And then they did CT scans at regular intervals. 
Looking at the baseline statistics, they're pretty much similar all across the board. Similar incidence of um, metastatic disease, PDO1 status, and BRAF uh, status. I really wanted to point out, um, it's not really baseline statistic, but I couldn't f figure out where else to put it, but the number of doses that patient received in each arm. You can see that with the nivolumab arm, they received quite a few more doses than with the ipilimumab arm or the uh, combination arm. With that being said, it's important to keep in mind that the ipilimumab alone regimen is four doses of ipilimumab. So they completed their therapy. But with the ipilimumab plus nivolumab arm, they could get four doses of ipilimumab followed by nivolumab monotherapy alone indefinitely. So they got ipilimumab plus nivolumab, but they didn't get very many, they didn't get 15 nivolumab doses. They got fewer doses. So looking at the response to treatment, I think there's some pretty impressive numbers in here. Looking at the complete response and partial response, you can just, glancing at the numbers, over 50% of the patients getting nivolumab plus ipilimumab had some sort of response. And that's huge, especially compared to ipilimumab alone. Uh, nivolumab alone is still up in the air. And so their, one of their main um, secondary objectives was looking at the percent of patients with some sort of objective response, so the combination of complete responses and uh, partial responses. And like I said, over 50% of patients who got the nivolumab plus ipilimumab had some sort of decrease in their disease. And then the time to objective response was same uh, throughout uh, all three arms. Uh, looking at the progression-free survival, the Kaplan-Meier curves, I think it's even more, more impressive to see the differences between the nivolumab arms plus the ipilimumab plus ipi plus, anyway, you know what I'm saying, um, the, the differences between the three arms. The top, uh, the top chart is all patients, so whether or not they had pdl one positivity or not, and um, ipilimumab was uh, had by far the lower, the shortest uh, progression-free survival. Plan uh, panels B and C split patients up into PDL1 positive and PDL1 negative, and um, it's unclear to me whether or not um, nivolumab alone or niv uh, nivolumab plus ipilimumab alone is better in patients with PDL1 positivity. But we can definitely say that it's better than nivolumab or ipilimumab alone. So the other thing I mentioned that I liked about this study is, is looking at the adverse events. I think it's um, very impressive looking at the numbers. Looking at any, any treatment-related adverse event, um, wow, time has flown by. Anyway, I'll shorten this up and get to the nitty gritty. Um, looking at any adverse event, many, many patients had, had a high incidence of adverse events in the combination arm, with diarrhea being the most common, dermatologic being um, uh, second most common, but then also I want to point out hypothyroidism and colitis um, as other significant side effects. And I think it's also impressive here that a significant amount of patients ended up stopping therapy due to side adverse effects, and that's either due to patients preferring to stop therapy due to intolerable side effects or the patients unable to continue therapy due to uh, study protocol. So looking at gastrointestinal adverse events, those tend to be the most common with immunotherapy, and they can also become very severe very quickly. It's important to uh, realize that any patient that has abdominal pain who's on one of these immunotherapies, you have to stop immediately and say, what is the cause of this uh, abdominal pain? Because especially with the ipilimumab, 
It has a high incidence of colitis and per intestinal perforation, and it can become very severe very quickly. If they do determine that it is colitis, you have to get, fair, you have to get treatment right away. Hepatitis is probably the most common non-intestinal uh, gastrointestinal side effect, and it can appear um, later in the course of therapy, but it can appear as just asymptomatic LFT elevations to full-blown liver failure. And um, pancreatitis is often, is also a side effect that we've seen with immunotherapy. So with dermatologic IREs, most of them are low-grade and self-limiting and can be treated with just a topical steroid. Um, mostly it's a maculopap maculopapular rash um, that is d distinctly different than, say, the, the acneform rash that comes with the EGFR inhibitors like erlotinib. It's more of a, it's more of a drug, ra like a true drug rash reaction. And these often occur very quickly within uh, therapy, within the first few cycles, and also resolve quickly with treatment. So I'm going to skip this slide and go back to it later. I wanted to touch on endocrine IRE, uh, immune-related immune adverse events, because this, these are some side effects that um, can present very similarly to infection. And um, it's important to realize that if a patient's on immunotherapy, that these are in the differential. Patients uh, can have, can develop thyroiditis, which either can present as hyperthyroidism or hypothyroidism. And that's because as the thyroid inflames, it dumps the contents. And so they'll have a transient hyperthyroidism followed by a hypothyroidism in which the, they'll require lifelong levothyroxine therapy. Primary adrenal insufficiency can be a very indolent side effect with just chronic fatigue, tiredness, headaches, but it can also present as more of a septic shock picture uh, with a, in, uh, fevers, abdominal pain, low blood pressure, and it's important to differentiate between an adrenal crisis and, say, um, an infectious colitis picture because if it's infectious, you're going to give antibiotics. If it's immune-related, you have to give steroids. And it's important to differentiate between those two early on. And then hypophysitis is um, inflammation of the pituitary gland. And that can appear as very nonspecific uh, side effects. It can appear as thyroiditis, and it can appear as primary adrenal insufficiency. These usually occur um, later in the course, and most patients, unfortunately, will have to have lifelong uh, either hormone or th thyroid replacement or lifelong steroid replacement. So looking at the pituitary axis, you can kind of differentiate by looking at labs what kind of situation you're in. Um, just for example, if you have a th patient with uh, low T4, low, TSA, low T4, that should be signaling back to the pituitary gland to increase TSH, so your typical hypothyroidism picture. But if you have pituitary dysfunction, your TSH is also going to be low. And in that case, you have to, um, with immune therapy, you have to get an MRI of the pituitary gland, and, in, and if it is inflamed, institute IV steroids immediately to bring that inflammation down. But like I said in the previous page, um, unfortunately, many of these patients do not return to baseline. So some other pertinent um, immune-related adverse events. Pneumonitis is also something that you can see with these, and it does present as an infectious picture. A patient is admitted to the ER. The doctor sees that they're, they have cancer. They're on chemotherapy. They automatically think, hey, this patient's immunosuppressed. Let's start them on pneumonia antibiotics. Well, that's not the case with immunotherapy. Well, it can be the case, but it's not always the case. And we do need to... Um, differentiate, determine whether or not it's an infectious or an inflammatory picture so we can treat it appropriately. Um, I don't really have much to add, so we're going to move on. I mentioned some, in some slides some treatments. The cornerstone of therapy is to hold and then treat after, and then determine the cause and then to treat with systemic steroids, IV for the more severe symptoms and then PO for the less severe symptoms. And often these are, these are high doses, and so you have to do a long taper 
and um, also keeping in mind the side effects of a long-term steroid dose. So uh, opportunistic infections, insomnia, gastritis, worsening of, uh, of diabetes. Immune modulators are mostly used for the very, very severe unresponsive to steroid side effects. So I did have a little bit on outcomes after uh, having to treat with steroids. The point is that whether or not a patient has to get steroids because of a side effect, it, do, it does not, or at least they found that it does not affect the, ba the patient's um, response to immunotherapy. So we can treat these uh, side effects with confidence that they can still get therapy afterwards as long as it's not too much of a severe reaction and still find benefit from the immunotherapy. And so by and large, um, we're going to look at lab values, but we also have to keep in mind that we look at TSH and cortisol levels as needed. But a lot of it has to do with counseling. A patient who is at home, who has abdominal pain, not, might not want to call the clinic you know, as uh, right away, but they need to know that it's okay that they need that they could call their nurse and say, "Hey, I'm having abdominal pain. What do I do?" And that's pretty much it. I have some time for a few questions. <laughs> So, in general, I don't think that giving immunochemotherapy is, an, is um, given with patients with a pre-existing autoimmune side effect just because it can, hap it can initiate a flare. Um, th in the studies that I've seen, they have excluded patients with autoimmune disorders because of that risk of flare and the risk of um, pretty pretty nasty side effects. So if you have uh, autoimmune colitis, you would have an even greater risk of bowel perforation if you're given epilimumab. Um, patients who, they also excluded patients who are on long-term steroids because you have to have an intact immune system and a competent immune system for these uh, drugs to work. And, the, and steroids obviously decrease the immune system. So those patients might not see, those who are long-term steroids for their autoimmune disease might not see the same benefit from immune therapy as other patients who don't have an immune disease. Any other questions? All right.